Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. Governor Mark Dayton and state lawmakers have finalized Minnesota's two-year budget. We'll look at some of the winners and losers, plus a big event coming this August. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. The 2017 legislative session went into overtime, but lawmakers were eventually able to complete work on the next two-year state budget, as well as bills providing tax relief and funding for capital improvements. Joining me in the studio to reflect on the session is Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka. Welcome. Good to be here. This week, the legislature filed lawsuit against the governor over his line item veto of legislative funding. What is the best outcome? Well, my hope is in the end we don't have to go all the way through with it. We don't want to sue the governor, uh, but he can't defund the House and the Senate any more than he could defund the, the judicial branch. He can't do that. But so far we haven't been able to find a way through that, and so we have to take the next step, and we file the lawsuit. If we can find an off-ramp, we will, but he wanted us to renegotiate some of the things that we all negotiated, we all agreed to, and he signed off on, and, and we're not going to do that either. So what's the best outcome then? Well, I think if maybe we might be able to find something. We had mentioned let's do the pension bill that we didn't get done. We all thought that uh, that was a good idea. Maybe we could have done a special session for that, and then he could have changed the language and funded the House and Senate. But, you know, so we need to find something like that. And so I'm open, but if we can't get there, we have to file the lawsuit because July 1, we don't have new money coming into the House or Senate and the resources we have right now, that would last about a month. And uh, my first priority will be to pay all of our employees, uh, Democrats, Republicans, nonpartisan, they're gonna get paid first. But we also have a big building that we're responsible for here, and if we don't make that payment, the state's bond ratings will be impacted. And so there's a lot of consequences here. This is high stakes, we should not be playing this game. It's never happened anywhere else that uh, a governor's defunded the House and Senate. So. You know, we, th we think it's important we stand up for the House and Senate, but we'd like to find a way through without going to court. Many Capitol observers are pointing to your leadership this session as a key reason so much bipartisan work was done. Will you continue to play this sort of peacemaking role that you've had? Yeah, I, it's sort of my temperament. You know, I, I like to build bridges. I'm a better bridge builder than a bomb thrower. And so in, in the Senate, we had 34, or the opposite side had 33, so we had a one vote majority. It forced somebody like me to rise up, and, and so it's the perfect time for me. Uh, I respect the governor. We don't always agree, but I definitely respect him, and so we can we talked very candidly about all kinds of issues. That's how I think we got most of the bills to the final finish line. I'll keep doing that. I think the governor will too, and, and working the House, the Senate, and the governor this time around, we got a lot done. We should be, Minnesotans should be proud of all the things we got done. If you were addressing a group of middle-income Minnesotans, what accomplishments would you underline for this session? Well, for sure the tax bill. And, and if you were a senior, we, we exempted Social Security income for them. If you're a, a small business or a farmer that's in the middle income, small business got a business property tax re relief, uh, ag got an ag property tax relief. And so the tax bill really was aimed at middle America, middle Minnesota, and so that was a really big thing. A lot of people are complaining about our roads and bridges. We got our first ever or biggest ever roads and bridges bill that was done, help people travel, go wherever they want to do. We got real ID for people, so if they want to travel to other states or go other places, they now can get on a plane and don't have to worry about that. So pretty much everywhere you looked, we, we did something good for them. And probably the last one was if you have health insurance and you were paying the premiums and rates were going up 67%, we actually provided relief for them as well. So a lot of different things were done for them that I think that they will greatly appreciate. And what about for college students? What can they look forward to? So the two things that, that the students got is number one, as they acquire student loans, they're gonna be able to, to get a $500 per year credit on their student loans, which is a big, big thing when you're having to pay those back. And then higher ed, we, we increased the funding for higher education, but we also made them hold the line on what the tuition is gonna be in the future. So. Both ways, we did some really good things for them. When the session began, your caucus moved up the deadlines in order to bring transparency, transparency to the process. In the end, a lot was done behind closed yeah. doors and those budget bills were getting to the floor without a lot of time for everybody to read them. So in the future, what more can be done so that Minnesotans have the transparency in the process mm -hmm. that they're looking for? Well, first of all, this is the first year I was majority leader. And you know, I wish the end 
hadn't been so hectic. Uh, it's hard to explain, but when you're 34, 33, it's really difficult. Um, and we had uh, two senators who had a parent die, so we had to, any of those days we couldn't do any work because we only had 33 when they were gone. We had another senator that was uh, sick, had a heart attack, and had stints and had to come vote two days later. So all of that made it difficult. But the key thing that I advocated from the very beginning is that we have targets early. The targets are what does the House, Senate, and Governor agree we're going to spend in each area? And we couldn't get those until I believe the Friday before the final session at the end of Monday night. We needed those two weeks ahead of time. That was what we were advocating for, and I still will, because then you have all that time to negotiate, two weeks of time instead of just a few days. Mm -hmm. uh, Governor Dayton expressed concern in particular with the tax bill, that it will jeopardize the state's fiscal health into the future. Are you confident that the state can afford the size of the tax bill? Yeah, so it was the biggest tax bill in, in 18 years. Um, but what I would say is when you look at how much was actually tax relief, it was a little over 400 million, under 500, over 400. And we figured that in the next four years, that would be about a billion dollars of actual revenue decrease, tax relief. Uh, spending in the next four years will go up six billion. So I've made the case that it's not about the tax relief we gave. If we have a problem with our, our budgets in the future, it will be because spending continues to increase at rates that are hard to control. HHS is growing at a rate of 20 percent, but overall it was growing 9 percent. So the small tax relief we gave compared to the spending increases is, is that that's the issue. It's not the tax relief, it's spending. And so that's my case. I, I thought we should give some back, you know, so we gave it to seniors, farmers, small business owners, we gave it to students and, and others, um, but I, it wasn't a huge, huge number. Well, speaking of health and human services, um, that area of the state budget is expected to continue to grow into the future, and funding generally falls below the demand. So if this is a trend for the future, how, as a state, can that be managed? Well, without a doubt, this will be the most complex area that we have to deal with. I, I mentioned it's growing 20%. We can't sustain that, and yet we have an age wave coming that the costs are only going to go up. And so add to that that the federal government is likely going to cut a billion dollars or more from Minnesota's money we get from the feds, and we have a real problem. And so a couple of things. One, uh, I've s uh, set up a subcommittee with uh, Senator Jensen and Senator Klein. They're both doctors. I said, what are some of the things that are truly driving up costs in Minnesota? I'd rather people that are actually in it day in and day out to begin to explore where can we save money, but also how we deliver care to people that require MA or, or any of the different programs that we administer. Do we need to do them different? And I was out in D.C. last week and had a chance to visit with Secretary Price, uh, HHS uh, Secretary, and he said, I, he said he wants states to reform, he wants states to lead the way, and that they will give waivers much easier for states to improvise and try new things. And so it's going to be a big, big deal. I've told the governor I think this is the biggest thing we're going to have to work on next year and probably the year after and the year after. But uh, we're aiming to do that. I'm excited that we have the opportunity to try. There appeared to be a desire this session to ease regulations to aid job growth. When looking back, will this session be one that businesses will appreciate? Well, the tax structure that we changed will help businesses. Uh, the, the roads and bridges that we're going to fund now will help roads and bridges. Uh, we did some reforms on education, uh, getting uh, more of the best teachers in front of the students, which will help create the people that they're going to have employees for jobs. So I would say overall they, they would say it was a very, very good year. Uh, regulations is something we're always going to have to look at, both federally and on a state level. I feel we could do a lot more there. Um, just a one example, Polymet, uh, it's the copper nickel mine, and I think it's been over 15 years of permitting to actually do what they want to do. Uh, there was uh, somebody in the historical society that was actually holding up that permit, you know, and so uh, the governor, the House and Senate agreed that we needed to change that little thing and move it into a, some other area so that there was more accountability and more freedom to flow as far as getting permits done. So simple things like that we're working on, but they're harder to do than people can imagine. Last question. If you erase the final squabble here at the end, how would you rate this legislative session? Was there good bipartisan compromise? Absolutely was. And I, and I would say, you know, I, I told the governor, we all should be taking a victory lap about what we did because it was Republicans in the House and, Sen in House and Senate 
but the governor signed on to those bills and so we had reforms in education with over a billion dollars of new funding roads and bridges got done real id got done tax relief got done i mean everywhere you looked something good happened for minnesota and so that would be something we should all be proud of uh, the, the last uh, i hope it's just a hiccup i think we'll get through it uh, but we showed that bipartisan efforts really can make a difference. Senator Kozelka, I want to thank you so much for your time today. You bet. Even though he signed the tax bill into law, Governor Mark Dayton recently showcased young Minnesotans concerned about smoking in an effort to renegotiate with Republican leaders a cut in the Premier's cigar tax and the removal of the inflationary indexing of the cigarette tax. The health of all these young people and others in the back there and everyone else uh, in Minnesota is a lot more important than, than uh, appeasing big tobacco. And that's what was the motivating force in, in, in this provision. So it's uh, one that definitely should, should be removed. And those who uh, continue to advocate for it should be really challenged as to what public purpose they think it serves. About half of all smokers felt motivated to take steps towards quitting as a result of the increased taxes. The tax increase also had a positive impact on youth cigar smoking. The year after the tobacco was uh, enacted, we saw the first decrease in youth cigar smoking rates since those data were first started to be collected in year 2000. Given the disproportionate impact of tobacco on low-income populations and populations of color and American Indians, tobacco taxes also help us with our advancing health equity reports where we want every Minnesota to have the opportunity to be healthy. This year, the legislator decided to make cigars cheaper. While well, I've seen from other kids how smokers start with the cheap products because you can afford them. That's the one way that tobacco companies can really get to you. Another way is by brainwashing you into believing that smoking is cool and that will, it will make you feel good. Kids think cigars are harmless compared to cigarettes. They don't realize what addiction is and um, the more they do it, the harder it is to stop. One puff leads to another, and it all adds up to a lifelong addiction, which means a short life. But there's one thing you may, have, may not have noticed about cigars. They appeal to a lot to young men like me, that, well, at least they look like me. The guy, they make guys feel important, like they're rich and powerful. And once you try it, you're hooked. At the Capitol, when they agreed to cut the price on cigars, I didn't know what they were thinking. I don't know how they thought they could get away with it. Maybe they thought it would, be, it would only be noticed by rich people, but by attracting them to smoking, it's going to hurt a lot of people who aren't rich. That's why this is, uh, tobacco uh, change is so important, because without that indexing in there, over time, the price of cigarettes stays flat, and that, of course, as our buying power increases over a decade, uh, they become more, more affordable for kids and for others who are smoking. On last week's program, we showed you a portion of the conversation I had with the chair of the E-12 Education Finance Committee, Senator Carla Nelson, about some of the many provisions in the education bill. Here's part two of our conversation. Tell me a little bit about what in the bill is, is directed towards the Reading Corps and reading literacy. Uh, the Reading Corps is a Minnesota-made program, highly successful early literacy program that works with kids uh, age three to grade three. Uh, personalized tutoring and it is so successful that it is being incorporated around the nation as well and uh, they're highly trained reading tutors through AmeriCorps. AmeriCorps sponsors the Reading Corps. Highly trained tutors and proven techniques and strategies that get kids reading uh, early and make sure that they're reading on grade level. Right here in Minnesota, Reading Corps in just one year has uh, foregone or prevented over nine million dollars in special education referrals because these kids were becoming proficient readers early on rather than being referred to special education. There's been a randomized controlled uh, double study showing the effectiveness of Reading Corps. And so we were able to significantly increase Reading Corps funding, uh, which we think is also uh, important to help closing our achievement gap 
And we also, Reading Corps is going to focus on some very uh, specialized areas as well. It's going to focus on those four-year-olds that we talked about with some earliest learners, making sure they're ready for kindergarten when they get there. And then also our Native Americans, our Indian schools, also uh, zeroing in on helping those students become great early literacy scholars. We need to make sure all kids are reading uh, on grade level by the end of grade three. Reading Corps is a proven way to do that. Let's turn, uh, if you don't mind, to lead testing in school districts. Why is this important? Well, what we have found, including in my own school district, one of the districts I represent, is that when the water fountains were tested, uh, the water was found to contain significant lead particles. And, and lead is, causes brain damage, right? It causes uh, brain damage. Uh, there's no safe level for lead. Uh, and so to think that our school children were drinking from school water fountains that contained lead is very troubling. And many times, these are our oldest schools with the oldest pipes in some of our most um, disadvantaged areas. And so it's very important that one, parents can be assured that when they send their child to a public school in Minnesota, they know that that child's drinking water is not going to contain lead. This legislation requires that school districts test for lead at least once every five years, but most importantly, that it publish the results on the web uh, and uh, in press as well, so that parents are aware. So I think it's a very um, proactive measure. We spend a lot of time and money trying to correct things that can be caused by lead poisoning. So good to have safe water in our schools. Absolutely. Uh, let's talk about Innovation Zones Pilot Program. This is a public-private partnership. How will this work sure. and what's the goal? We have uh, two innovation zone pieces of legislation, one directed specifically at career and tech education mm -hmm. and one in general. And basically it gives the school districts a little bit more flexibility. One, they can partner with the public as well, so you have the public-private partnership, but also it gives them greater flexibility in how they run their schools, manage their schools, and also then we think that will lead to better outcomes as well. Every area of the state's a little bit different. It has different needs, uh, different students, and they're pilot programs because we want to see how they're going to work. And this will just let them have the flexibility that they need to incorporate different elements to meet their students' needs. Yes, exactly. Very much local control. Last fall, the Star Tribune published a story about how some students were not able to remain in their school when they were taking PSEO classes or post-secondary enrollment classes. Courses. Sure. And there were some complaints about that. I believe part of this bill addresses that concern? It does, and we had a significant hearing in the Senate Education Committee about this. What we found is that high school students who were going to college campuses and getting both that high school credit and college credit sometimes would want to come back to their high schools while they were a high school student enrolled there and use the high school computer lab or internet to do their college work. And for some reason, some school districts were having a difficulty with that. Uh, this legislation does uh, require that school districts provide a place or allow students to come on campus. They are high school students. They should be able to come to the high school to do work, uh, to do college work, uh, not to cause trouble or do other things. Uh, and so it's very narrowly tailored, which was very important. Another key element regarding our post-secondary enrollment options piece in this bill has to do with weighted gradings grades. Some students, uh, some, some school districts were giving, like if you take a PSEO class uh, and we're not weighting that, it's just the same as your one for and an often F. And those PSEO classes are more challenging than the traditional high school classes. So Correct. The, the students who were maybe being more adventuresome were getting a lower GPA? That's it exactly, Shannon. And uh, what this legislation just says is that school districts need to have a policy on weighting grades. They can determine what that policy is. They might say, we don't weight grades at all. They're all the same no matter where you take the course. Or they might say that, you know, when you take a college credit, we're gonna give you uh, a little bump for your GPA. It's up to the school districts. Mm -hmm. But what was happening is parents were caught unaware. They didn't know that there was weighting for one type of course work and not the other. So this is just uh, good public information, making sure that our parents and our students know how grades are determined in these various options that they have for post-secondary enrollment. And one last thing, there is language in the bill that has to do with child sexual abuse prevention education. 
How is that going to work? Again, this is called Aaron's Law. And again, it is a permissive language that allows the school districts the opportunity to work with uh, nonprofits and determine uh, how to best uh, address these issues uh, and really in a preventative manner and work with students uh, knowing some, it reminds me a little bit of years ago, we had something called good touch, bad touch mm -hmm. in the schools. So again, it's bringing awareness to this so that students are aware and most importantly, they know they have a trusted adult that they can seek out. And so this is education then for the students, optional for the districts, whether they want to do it? Uh, actually, no, I can't remember on the optional piece, okay. uh, but it's flexible for the districts flexible in determining district. how best to, to make sure that all students are safe and know that they have a point of contact in the school system. Senator Nelson, it's always so good to talk to you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Shannon. Great to be here. Hmong dancers offered a glimpse of the variety of events planned for the grand opening celebration of the Minnesota State Capitol in mid-August. Governor Mark Dayton and Supreme Court Chief Justice Lori Gilday and state officials recently promoted the August event. We are often questioned or criticized for our inability to work uh, constructively together on a bipartisan, nonpartisan basis, but this was throughout. Uh, one that the commission itself, which was represented by uh, all the four of the branches uh, of, of the bodies and uh, Chief Justice and you know, Attorney General, Lieutenant Governor, myself, and the citizen members, everybody worked together. We had, sure, we had honest disagreements, but we resolved those, and we worked together. There was no uh, partisanship, no effort to one-up or upstage anybody else. It was just a really phenomenal effort, and, and I, I think everybody who was a part of that should be proud of their role in, uh, in pulling this off so well. And finally, I want to thank the people of Minnesota. I mean, is, this, is, this is your capital. And I hope you'll come to the grand opening and, and enjoy it. And, and those of you who and I find there are always many, surprisingly, who haven't never been here before, uh, come and see uh, the splendor of this uh, place and what it represents. That it represents a place where uh, our democracy resides and where people come together with their honest differences and disagreements and all different perspectives from all over the state. But this. Uh, this building was built, you can see, it was built to last. We have an all things Minnesota party plan for August 11th to the 13th and the, uh, when the capital is returned to Minnesotans officially. There's gonna be a little something for everybody and it's free. Uh, whether you're a toddler or were here when the capital was still a new building or somewhere in between, uh, there will be an event for you. There will be kids zones, uh, indoors and out. There will be an interactive scavenger hunt, uh, capital scavenger hunt. Uh, on our event app, there will be a hot dish educational series ranging from conversations with Vice President Mondale and Governor Al Qui to the history of brewing in Minnesota. There will be dance and music performances that highlight the rich diversity of our state. There will be yoga on the lawn and of course, as Minnesotan as you get, there will be blueberry muffins and milk. We have restored the strength, function and beauty of this structure and reaffirmed our state's commitment to good governance and civic engagement. Just as it was in 1905, in the months ahead, we will see thousands of Minnesotans, and hopefully in August, we'll see hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans travel to St. Paul to enjoy the grandeur of this remarkable building. Governor Mark Dayton's premier education initiative for several years has been funding for universal pre-kindergarten. I recently spoke with former education finance chair and current DFL education lead, Senator Chuck Wieger, about this year's efforts to prepare children for kindergarten. In terms of funding for kindergarten readiness programs, it appears that what passed in this education bill is similar to what the DFL Senate proposed two years ago when you were education chair. Are you satisfied with the level of funding in this current budget bill that's going to go towards kindergarten readiness? Uh, we have supported a number of initiatives to increase early education opportunities over the years, but our highest priority now is what the governor has been championing, and that's for pre-K-4. And the governor had recommended $175 million for the pre-K-4. 
that would have been adequate. And that was provided for in his budget, and that would have made me very satisfied. So the $50 million, one time only, uh, that's, that's an improvement. It's helpful, but it didn't get the job done like we should have. Uh, and I want to say it's, it's Governor Dayton is just speaking on behalf of uh, parents and teachers and our next generation of students. There is a big demand out there. Uh, when we passed the bill last year, uh, right away districts started applying. And in fact, the majority of districts that applied within weeks, they were told, sorry, we had to stop because there's not enough funds available. There is demand for high quality pre-K-4. And these were districts throughout Minnesota and uh, rural areas especially were being told that we just don't have enough funds right now, but maybe next year. Governor Dayton, through the pre-K-4 initiative that he had in his proposal, would have done that. And eventually we will get there, just like eventually we got to full day kindergarten. Some of the same arguments that uh, opponents of pre-K-4 uh, have had that uh, there's not uh, enough resources or the schools don't want it, the facilities. School districts want this. What are some provisions in this bill that you are happy with? Uh, the two and two on uh, the formula, 2% each year. Yep. Uh, that was the governor's proposal. Um, it, it took quite a while to get to that level. There was some negotiating and, back and forth, right. yes. And so I was pleased that would be the number one, uh, because, and that's the bulk of the bill. And then, as I mentioned, uh, getting you know, some money, even though it was only one time, for the early uh, education, uh, pleased with that. And, and what more needs to be done? Uh, we need to continue to evaluate the overall goal, world's best workforce, our graduation rate, and then how do we get there? And it all gets back to early education. And so we, we will be doing additional uh, review. There's going to be a legislative auditor uh, uh, review of uh, programs in this area. And I'm sure. In pre-kindergarten uh, readiness? Yes. OK. Yeah, you know, just the whole you know, delivery system. There's a big overlap, too, uh, our, you know, with the health and human services. In fact, we had some bipartisan meetings, uh, Senator Ralph and uh, Icorn and uh, um, you know, just you know, Senator Hoffman was involved, mm -hmm. Senator Abler, and uh, you know, a number of us were going to meetings as to the amount of money that goes into health and human services for daycare, where they are providing services too in in high quality programs that will get you ready for school, and and you know, so you know, what can we do to maybe streamline the process or get the most efficient use of resources. We found that there was not ideal amount of communication going on with providers in these various areas. Uh, the biggest part of our budget is for E12 mm -hmm. right now. The fastest growing budget is for health and human services and at some point, maybe 2020, uh, you know, it would uh, overtake uh, the, the E12 budget, uh, just on trends and mm -hmm. healthcare costs. There's a lot of unknowns, mm -hmm. and so we need to be as efficient as we can. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.